Welcome to Talking Education from the Varki Foundation. By entering conversations like this, you are helping to raise teachers' voices and give every child a quality education. Please watch, click, subscribe and start talking education. Our vision is quality education for every child, through work in the classroom to the highest halls of government. This new decade brings the opportunity to release the vital conversations usually confined to conference halls to the 2.65 billion people that use social media. Education debates aren't the preserve of academics. Everybody deserves to be part of them. Together, we have an opportunity to advance and bring a diverse audience into our mission as we discuss education's problems, collaborate on their solutions, and most importantly, show the incredible work of those on the front line of education. Welcome to Talking Education. Today we're discussing COVID-19 and mental health and well-being. Is the COVID-19 global pandemic also a mental health time bomb? As teachers and schools and students prepared to reopen physical bricks and mortar buildings very, very soon. Do we need to make sure that we are prepared for the well-being and the mental health of our students who have been out of school for many, many months? Whether that's nursery education or whether that's undergraduate or postgraduate university education, this is something that is a serious matter that we must discuss. My name is Dr. Fran Marana and I am the Chief Education Ambassador at the Varki Foundation. I'm also a principal of a secondary state school in London, Westminster, where we are situated in the fifth most deprived constituency in the country. I welcome a very, very knowledgeable and experienced panel to help me understand further the mental health impact that awaits us when schools reopen. So I would like to warmly welcome Marjorie Brown, our 2018 Global Teacher Prize top panelist. Hello, Marjorie, how are you? Hello, Simon. I'm fine. And you? Good, thank you. Lovely to have you here. Thank you for joining us. I welcome also, I welcome also Shunta Takino, our junior counsellor and young associate at the OECD. Welcome, Shunta. Hi, Simon. Thank you for the invitation. You're most welcome. And thank you so much for making the time. I'm sure you're very, very busy to join us today. I also warmly <laughs> welcome Andrea Zakharafu our 2018 Global Teacher Prize winner, um, a very big star in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Andrea. Not sure about big star, but it's just such a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Simon. Good morning to everyone or good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, lovely to have you. And we are awaiting a fantastic student for, of the International Baccalaureate Diploma Programme, Anna Muller, who will be joining us. That's, oh, Anna's here. I'm sure you were just getting um, registered at school. Uh, good morning, Anna, welcome. Uh, Anna is a, an International Baccalaureate Diploma Programme student at the Westminster Academy. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Lovely to have you here. So we have a great panel today to discuss the very important issue of mental health and wellbeing. Um, part of academic success is, is not just about the academic achievement, but it's about the well-being, the growth, the mental capacity and the psychological capacity that we enable our students of all ages to discover and experiment and to be able to be very, very resilient in times of um, uncertainty. And as you know, one of those times is absolutely here at the moment in terms of COVID-19. So should we expect a mental health crisis um, when we are semi out of COVID-19 when we return to school? Andrea, what do you think? What are your thoughts on that? I, I think we are going to experience a lot of problems and we are going to be taking on a lot of problems. Um, and I also think that it's not just the students. We also need to bear in mind that we also have got teachers who have been self-isolating, um, who have been by, working by themselves in their bubbles, teaching online. Um, so we're not. it's not just about managing the transition of our young learners coming into our schools, but always keeping an eye out for the teachers as well how what their journey has been um, what their experience has been um, there is going to be a huge huge problem but one of the great things about schools is and what i know about young people is that they love the structure and they love the systems and once they get into their routines i think that's going to be such a great coping mechanism for them and schools provide that of course so, um, yes, it is very interesting times ahead for us once we get our young people back into our worlds. 
Thank you, Andrea. And I mean, you, you talk a little bit about teachers as well in terms of preparing teachers to be able to deal with the um, crisis that awaits us in terms of mental health and well-being, our own as teachers and the mental health and well-being of ourselves and our peers and our colleagues, but also students as well. Marjorie, in terms of your school context, what kind of preparation do you think your school is making um, to look after teachers and students as we prepare to return? Well, in South Africa, some of the, the students have returned to school and some of the teachers have returned. Um, great, our final year students, grade 12 students, and our final year of, of junior school, grade seven students have already returned in most schools in South Africa. Uh, there are, of course, now a kind of split for teachers of having to continue teaching online for some grades and teaching face-to-face -face for some grades. Some teachers are not back at school because of comorbidities. And yet other schools in our country have not opened in spite of that ruling of grade 12 and grade seven pupils returning because schools have been vandalized during lockdown and other schools have not got running water and the facilities to allow them to return. So we have a re really mixed bag in South Africa that continues to highlight the inequality in our country. That has led some teachers to feel really stressed about returning to school under uh, um, conditions that are not conducive to return. And today the and yesterday, the Congress of South African Students have been disrupting the return to school saying that conditions are not right to return. Whereas in independent schools, the return has been relatively smooth. Um, although some students, particularly schools that have boarding houses, some students can't get back to school. Um, they're either offshore or across borders, and so they can't return. So there is this split at the moment. For the students that have returned to school, they have felt an, a, a feeling of excitement initially to go back to school. But then a number of them have voiced that the, the social um, connection feels strange because they have to maintain social distancing, they have to wear their masks. And so a lot of the things they were looking forward to that keep them going, the social connectivity, um, feels strained and not quite what they were looking forward to. So it really is quite a mixed bag. It is. And also in terms of looking at um, food and, and in particular in places like South Africa, um, the connection and the relationship between food and mental health and psychological health. Do you want to say a little bit about what, what sort of experiences you've had in terms of making sure that your children that are around um, in your area have been fed? So in South Africa, there are about nine million children that are fed through the National Nutrition Scheme um, of school feeding. And this came to a halt uh, 100 days ago when our lockdown was declared. And so that means 9 million children were not receiving the food that they relied on at school. Um, some of them were able to access the increase in childcare grants in our country, which were, was declared by the government as a, a substitute but not all children qualify for the childcare grant. So a lot of children that receive food at school do not have anything at the moment. And currently there are NGOs such as Equal Education that are taking the government to court to, to reinstate that school feeding scheme as soon as possible. Now, even some of the students that have returned to school are not being fed. And then the students that have not yet returned to school have no access to food. So we have situations where a child in Limpopo is having to go in his grade 12 year and look for work gardening mm -hmm. to, to get some income into his family. So the malnutrition is, is starting to really show and, 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 and create enormous stress for children that have returned to school or are waiting to return to school. So our school has responded with, our students have responded with starting school feeding schemes of their own. Um, pupils and teachers and parents have pledged to give food every week 
that gets dropped off at a church in the inner city and really uh, indigent families can access that food. We also are supporting an urban food garden in the inner city and trying to get people to buy food from the urban food garden for the inner city pupils. So there are a number of initiatives that our food has got involved in just to try and reach these pupils that have not had any school feeding scheme for the past 100 days. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Marjorie, for, for that information. But also thank you so much for feeding these children and supporting these children to you and the others around you, because it's so important, you know, parity of um, offer and experience. We, talk, we talked a little bit about the independent sector having, you know, a different experience to, to the, 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 the public sector in, in terms of the provision that they're getting for education, but dare I say it for food as well. And the same applies to many, many, many places across the globe. So you talked a little bit about being quite creative in terms of using food gardens and using different initiatives. So I want to talk a little bit, if I can come back now to Andrea very quickly, um, in terms of the, the place of creativity in finding a solution for mental health and well-being. Um, well, it's, it's absolutely key. I'm just going to wait until that. Do you want me to go to someone else and come back to you, Andrea? Well, you can, well, you can do, but I don't think it's my phone. <laughs> This is the beauty of live interviewing. It's always very exciting. You never know, but because we're prepared for the unknown. So, do you want to talk a little bit about very quickly about creativity and the place of creativity? Well, I think it's really come down to being the saving grace, but not just for let's just talk about creativity for young people, but even for school leaders. We school leaders have not had much help from the government. Let's be faced. Let, let's be honest and let's face that. Um, information has come late, and we've just had to react. As, as you as you have done already um, in your in your role as being a principal, Dr. Rana. But um, we've just read, we've we've coped, and I think you need to be creative to do that. You need to have those particular skills um, to be able to um, just firefight and provide solutions. But in terms of creativity and for our young people, and what we what I've found is that this has been the one area where they have really dived into because they found that naturally this is a place where they can find joy, that they found happiness, that just being in that mindful experience of just um, creating a piece of artwork, craft, um, anything, food, cooking, has been something that has create, um, given them joy. So um, if schools or if area, um, you know, um, counties are not promoting creative activities for the young people, then it's something that will help rectify some of the mental health is issues which our young people will be experiencing now and also um, where, um, which we will be encountering when we get them back to school. Absolutely, thank you so much. And what we've seen is research is showing us at the moment that the sales of toys um, has rocketed in uh, over this pandemic because of course you know uh, parents are wanting to and guardians and carers are wanting to make sure that their children are not just um engaging in, in, in their learning at home but also playing and being creative and socializing through through toys etc because they don't have friends and, and so on so it's a really interesting um a thought about creativity and the place of creativity in the curriculum uh, across the globe so, Quinta, can I come to you very quickly about what do you think uh, the implications then um, after hearing Marjorie and Andrea? What are the implications, perhaps, of policy? What what should governments be doing, or what should be what should our governments across the globe be thinking about? Yeah. So, first of all, I think um, Marjorie, uh, you talked about the importance of uh, access to food and free school meals. So, I think what this this actually touches on upon, upon a really important implication for mental health policy. Um, is that firstly, um, we need to look at mental health as not just a health issue. Um, so at the OECD, uh, we're doing work to promote, um, what should we say, uh, to support countries in putting into place more comprehensive mental health, health policies that go beyond the health system. So in schools, in workplaces, in the social protection system, in youth organizations, um, because uh, in, in reality, um, you know, the, one of the challenges with policy is that mental health policy remains far too siloed um, and focused uh, only on health, and it fails to often look at all these contextual factors um, that can contribute to mental distress and poor mental health. Um, the other point I would add um, is that, uh, you know, school, 
there is great uh, disparities between and within schools, I think it's fair to say. But, um, you know, evidence shows that uh, school closures and its periods out of school really uh, drive a lot of the inequalities that we see in education uh, and in mental health. So um, it's really important that, uh, you know, governments, policymakers really focus on ensuring that, um, uh, the, as you know, as, as uh, students return to school, um, that, uh, you know, the, the most uh, disadvantaged and vulnerable groups are supported in schools. Um, because one of the, uh, you know, most devastating effects of this crisis is going to be that, um, you know, many children are go going to grow up in poverty. So even before the COVID-19 crisis, um, almost one in, uh, one in seven children grew up in poverty uh, across the OECD. And we know that that number increased following the Great Recession of 2007 and 8. So, um, you know, we're expecting something uh, similar happening again. So it's very important that, you know, we address this issue, um, especially because, uh, you know, childhood poverty is what, one of the, you know, the, the main drivers of uh, poor mental health, not just in childhood, but throughout the entire life course. Thank you, Shunta. That's, yes, absolutely. And, and, and many, many research papers have shown and briefing documents have shown that actually there's a direct correlation between <laughs> poverty and mental health. You know, um, and and of course, food, nutrition, um, exercise, food, all of those things are very, very important. Mm -hmm. And so, it almost makes me um, very much want to say out aloud that the um, crisis that we're facing in terms of mental health, uh, in particular, is a crisis of poverty that existed and deprivation that existed pre COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. It's just the fact that now everybody's watching and they can see what's happening. So I know in my constituency in in the United Kingdom, when people heard about COVID nineteen, and I don't know if it, if it happened in your areas, but people started to hoard, uh, whether it was toilet paper or food mm -hmm. or uh, and sanitizers or whatever it was. But I know in my constituency, which is the fifth most deprived constituency on the, on the in the country where I teach, um, the shops there were full of these things. And they were full of these things because people couldn't afford to hoard. So that um, uh, you know divide has ha has existed pre COVID nineteen. Um, I, I would say, and, and we do need better policies to make sure that we can overcome those divides. Can I come now to Anna? Anna, you're a student. You're in year twelve, um, studying the prestigious international baccalaureate diploma program, and um, I'm sure doing incredibly well. You're a student who hasn't actually been um, impacted in terms of your public examinations this academic year because you're not year 13 and those uh, year 13 students and year um, 11 students are the ones that have been impacted in terms of public examinations. But you will have been impacted in terms of your content, in terms of your curriculum for the next academic year. And what do you think? So three questions for you. The first one, and I'll stop and let you answer, and then I'll ask the other two. Um, what do you think schools, not government, but schools can do for you and your peers to prepare you for your examinations when you return into, back into school, into the bricks and mortar, the physical building? I definitely think that schools have to recognise that even if um, students have been trying their best, there's still going to be a big disparity in... Um, the education that they were able to have over like online, whether that's not being able to motivate themselves or the home environment they have, it's going to have to be something that teachers just see where they are and pick up from there. But everyone's kind of going to be at different places. Um, so definitely recognizing that and making sure they cater to, to all of those um, levels and also not I don't know, sometimes you get the feeling that um, when your grades have slipped, then the teacher is looking to you for the answer or that they want to know like what it is that that um, you have to do to make it better. But I think it really has to be a combination of um, a student and teacher working together to make up the ground, which isn't going to be easy. And it's definitely one of the consequences of being in lockdown and it's unfortunate, but it needs to be a very um, open and non, non guilt filled environment. Otherwise it's just gonna make everyone's stress um, a bit bigger. So mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely think that is something schools should focus on. Absolutely, and I think that your sort of points about understanding and empathy um, is a clear message for teachers that, you know, students are, even if you are providing an online, mm -hmm 
provision for students uh, we still need to make sure that it, we understand that this is not exactly how it would have been or should have been if you had been in the bricks and mortar school because we are actually bricks and mortar school and we're quite just managing by providing online learning to our children so to be empathetic is incredibly important and we must remind ourselves of that you're absolutely right and my second question for you Anna is when you talk to your friends or you talk to your peers in your uh, on your qualification on your course what kind of things are people worried about so you've talked a little bit about your grades but what are the other things that you are talking about that are that are affecting your mental health at the moment? Um, I definitely think that um, uncertainty for the future, even though we're in year 12, um, we know that next year a lot of university courses are going to be online and a lot of people are wondering, is it worth the money or like, mm -hmm. should I defer a year? And a lot of people from year 12 are wondering if people defer, is it going to be a much more saturated um for a lot more people going to apply for university when i am is it going to be harder to get in um also just generally about i think not being able to um do group sports and things like that and socialize it's while it's not something people who have been very stressed about i see the impacts that it's just generally not healthy because most um most teenagers can't motivate themselves to go outside and do exercise alone, really. Um, whereas that's a really big part of health. And yeah, it's something I feel like they should be more worried about because like how long it's been now, I don't know, two months without like proper regular exercise and the lack of routine is quite um, difficult, yeah. Um, but also <coughs> worried about getting back into school, um, about like, Action rate or like should I even be going and um will I have to catch up all the things I haven't done um at home and also I think the teacher student relationship has changed a bit because you only see them on online it's got a lot less personal kind of 2D um so I think you've lost that social element where you feel like you could go to them for with your problems because you've only seen them in an academic context yeah um and that would kind of hamper the ability to go to them if you were having mental health issues or ask for an extension because you don't feel like you're on that like personal level anymore perfect and, and thank you for that and my final question for you very quickly is if you had the responsibility to look after children coming back into school in your school and you were in charge of mental health and well-being at your school what kind of program uh, for the students would you design hmm. Perhaps two key elements just maybe two key elements of the program okay. um definitely one which okay so one big contributor to the mental health crisis that I think is going to happen is the fact that the last two months the we have only really seen the world and news through a digital filter so and that's very dramatized and it causes everyone right now a lot of stress so I think um some type of this is where we're going this is like the future is all right like a bit of I don't know maybe like supervised talking about the news. We don't really have that anymore. I mean, a bit in like um, home time, but making an effort to console people about like the future and that their education is gonna be fine. Um, and the second thing maybe, yeah, just basic ways to cope with stress and anxiety, but also um, how to notice them um, and kind of teach a student work and like, how to pick up indicators of if someone is feeling stressed and how to go about it and who you can go to, not just teachers, but also the online resources. If you might not want to talk to an adult about it, there are still really good like helplines or forums. So yeah, just making people aware of their um, options. Thank you so much, Anna. Um the two messages really coming out of that is to make sure that we don't forget what we've been through and continue talking about it using media news, et cetera, et cetera, um, during the school day, but also providing a program in which we can teach the skills of, of coping with the ways in which we have been feeling and the ways we will be feeling in terms of our anxieties, et cetera. Um, Andrea, did you have a question for Anna? 
Yeah, I, hi Anna, I just wanted to ask you, what was the, um, how did you, how have you coped, what strategies have you found to, to cope and to still remain engaging in your lessons and motivated? Because I know that's a huge problem with many youngsters across the world is that motivation. What's been the thing that's driven you to be able to do that? Um, I definitely think a routine as hard as it is to maintain and I have slipped out and in a again a bit um not just with school and doing like homework and things like that but also um sports regularly because it kind of keeps you um it's not healthy to be on one spot for so long um yeah. but also i think definitely getting involved in other things when you have school at home it does feel like you have a lot to do at least in year 12 um, and I always told myself, okay, I have a lot to do. And then at the end of the day, I'd be really tired. And I'm like, okay, now I can just like relax. But really what's been uh, the most beneficial um, is when I do other things outside of school. So like um, a painting or I um, was on a podcast, like things that really got my mind working on something else because online teaching isn't as engaging and it isn't as social as it was. But if I'm talking to my friends, if I'm doing something and accomplishing something, um, then it really makes you feel good and it makes you feel more motivated for everything else in your life. So, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank, thank you, Andrea. You know, what's really interesting is Anna attends a school that is um, in the 6%, 6% of state schools in the United Kingdom that are offering like-for-like -like, um, timetable online as they would in their bricks and mortar. Mm. And you hear the, the the anxieties that Anna is, is talking about. I mean, she's a phenomenal student and, it, mm. and it's and sharing her sort of insights about mental health and well-being but she is going she's attending a school that is in, in only the six percent of state schools so can we can you imagine what the remainder 94 percent of experiences out there could be like can, can we hear a little bit more about from marjorie about the sort of um you know something about the sort of broader social stresses in schools at this time but what kinds of things are, are you experiencing marjorie um thanks i I wanted to raise something that my students are, are very um, caught up in at the moment. Um, a number of my grade 12 students have said as much as they are stressing about their exams and keeping up with the curriculum, the inequality and the poverty at this time has really thrown up unemployment and we know that that has shone a focus on Black Lives Matter as well within the, the states and within South Africa and in many parts of the world. And one of my students just commented the other day that, you know, people think that we are like little robots, that we must just get through our exams and deal with that. And yet we are people who feel, we, we feel about the broader issues in society. We, we want to take a stand on Black Lives Matter. We want to take a stand on the increase in gender-based violence. And that takes a lot of emotional energy as well. White students are saying, they are coming to terms with challenges and having to spend time on self-reflection around their relationships with their peers of color. And black students are involved, taking a stand, engaging with people around the issue. And I, I kind of feel that as teachers, we have to remember that our students are looking at a very scary world right now. Mm -hmm. A world where racism has, has, has once again emerged and the need to make sure that people understand the history of that racism and where this pseudoscientific concept has emerged. We need to understand as well that our students are looking, particularly I teach at a girls' school, that girls are looking at this rise in gender-based violence and thinking, am I next? So... Besides just the curriculum and careers and exams, a lot of my students are saying they feel as though they're back in the 1960s with civil society protests and that they too, as people of conscience, need to take a stand. But how do they balance this with the, 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 the trauma of exams around the, 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 the corner? Many kids in state schools are going to have to do extra teaching um, extra lessons to cope with exams because they've lost teaching time. They haven't had 
the privilege of online devices and online teaching. So we, we're dealing with a lot of social stresses within school that go way beyond the educational curriculum. Thank you. Thank you for that, Marjorie. And it's, you know, you come to two really, really interesting and important points there, I think. One, um, so let, let's take each one um, uh, on its own. So the first one I would say is very much about, you talk about examinations and curriculum. So in terms of curriculum, when you look across our globe, we have specific subjects that are very much um, held in the limelight. So, you you know, your STEM subjects in particular, let's let's just say it. And um, and then you have your sort of secondary sort of poor relations, you know, the arts and, and, and the sort of, you know, the expressive arts and the physical education and, and all of those enterprising subjects and and for me as a teacher you know those art subjects those enterprising subjects those physical education subjects they're very much what builds character as well as the other subject areas in terms of stem you know you you we need character because with character you're able to be resilient you're, you're, you're able to sort of deal with pressure you're able to sort of have a view about the world and sort of understand other perspectives and, and be able to sort of work with other people etc cetera, etc cetera, which i know that you all understand but, but when we look at character and character education, it very much, in my experience, depends on the type of leadership you have in a school. If they believe it's important, it's at the heart of your curriculum. But if they don't believe it's important, then it's, it's, it's somewhere outside of the curriculum, probably far away from your school, and, and government policy stipulates the kind of curricula you want, wherever, regardless of where you're teaching in the world. So in that respect, when we look at exams and, and curriculum, we take them together. Do you think today the curriculum that we have in your area, so I'll go to Andrea first, in your area, in your country, is it fit for purpose? Has it been fit for purpose and will it be fit for purpose when we when we return to our bricks and mortar school, Andrea? Uh, no, it hasn't. <laughs> and, the, and the simple reason is going back to what Anna just said, and it's about them, what she needs. And what she needs is what thousands and millions of students around the world need. And it's that personalization. It's going back. It's making sure that the curriculum is fit for them and their futures. And at the moment, I don't think it is. So we're, and I think you're absolutely right. It is down to leadership and it's not just down to leadership of schools. It's down, it's the, it's the brave leadership that we need from governments. And it is to go back to what you just said about character building. What skills do our young people need to be able to find jobs, to be able to be resilient, to be able to think about um, uh, being creative and, and working with us and collaborating? Because these are skills which they need. They don't, I, I'm not convinced that at the moment within the curriculum that we are experiencing and the type of the type of um, experience our young people have in many of the schools in the UK, that they're able to appreciate this and that we are building them and supporting them to have that toolkit ready for them to be the masters of their own universe as it were um a lot needs to be changed and again it's down to that accountability who whose fault is it so is it the teacher's fault if every child um is not able to pass the examinations in the summer term next year so it's it's just really thinking about whose fault it's going to be and as a result of that what do we want to happen and let's make it happen let's do it let's make you know it's a great opportunity now we've learned so much from um from uh, the power of what schools do and how incredible they are but we also know about that our young people need something more and we need to get them engaged and re revitalized and excited about learning again so that the question is do i want to go to university should i go it's actually yes you know, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. And for that opportunity to be there for them. So let's, re you know, be, let's have br brave leadership out there. Let's really think about what are we, what are our young people, uh, what are they learning and why are they learning this? Is it useful for them in this day and age after what they've just experienced um, for the future of their lives? Is this what we want our, our, our countries to be in the next 10, 20 years? Absolutely. And as Marjorie said very eloquently that, you know, her children are asking these questions about sort of racism and about discrimination and who they are and questioning who they are. And this, this is something that very much we need to teach in our curricula. And I, I've heard lots and lots of people, I've been talking to lots and lots of teachers recently, and a lot of them are asking, you know, what can we change in terms of the content? What can we change in terms of our schemes of work, our unit plans, our curriculum? What should we change? And I actually think that's a wrong question. The question is, what do we change in our assessment? And not just for um, post um, COVID-19, but forever, because we have seen the things that are keeping our children um, safe, the things that are keeping our children secure. And we've just heard it from Anna. She paints, she does outdoor activities. 
the things that are keeping our children able to express themselves and try and cope as best as they can with Black Lives Matter is being able to express themselves, be, be able to be artistic and creative, be able to uh, engage and enjoy play and talk. And, um, you know, these are the things that we really need. But when, when yet when we look at our curriculum across the planet, you don't necessarily see, oh, there are some brave curriculums that do put character um, at the heart of, of their uh, education system, the International Baccalaureate, for example. But there are others that are just not, not really cutting it for us. So on that, Shunta, what are your sort of thoughts about how can governments help us? How can governments help us across the planet um, when we're looking at examinations for the next academic year? Because Andrea's absolutely right. We must not blame teachers for results not being where they should be if we're assessing or examining the wrong things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, as all of you have mentioned, uh, you know, school schoolwork related pressure is, you know, one of the, the leading factors that can cause mental distress. Um, among students. So in 2015, for example, the OECD found that more than one in two 15 year old students often worry or are anxious, you know, about their exams. Um, I think speaking uh, from a, more of a personal perspective, I, I think it's very uh, important that, you know, in, in the initial phase as, as we move back to school, that, um, you know, the emphasis is placed on restoring peer to peer interactions. Um, and as, you, as all of you have mentioned, um, reducing pressures related to examinations uh, and academic achievement. If you're not mentally healthy, um, you know, like that is the starting point. That is the foundation uh, to be able to achieve academically or to be able to sit examinations. Um, mm. As you know, as for the, the content um, of examinations, I think this is a really good time for us to um, rethink uh, what really is academic achievement? What is the purpose of schools? Um, and I think one thing that really um, the, the COVID crisis has shown to all of us is that school is, in a way, first and foremost, um, where you know, young people spend most of the time in their lives. It's where they build most of their skills outside the home. So um, I think you know, taking a more holistic approach to education that focuses uh, not just on uh, you know, academic achievement and exams, but on other elements that uh, all of you have mentioned is, is really important. Um, just to add one further point, uh, many of you have mentioned the importance of resilience, of character. Um, I completely agree uh, with these points, but I think we also should not be afraid to use the word mental health and to talk about mental health in schools going forward. Um, one of the real big issues uh, with mental health is the stigma that still surrounds mental health. Um, students feel embarrassed to talk about uh, their mental health sometimes. Um, teachers sometimes are still not fully aware of how to recognize or identify um, you know, mental distress. And, you know, like during this COVID crisis, we're seeing already a, a rapid rise in, you know, people. Uh, in, in young people um, reporting, uh, you know, symptoms of depression. So, for example, in Belgium, um, this is a pretty damning statistic, but among 16 to 24 year olds um, in March and April, the prevalence of self-reported depression was 30 percent. This is around three times higher than two years ago. So I think just to add to what all of you have said, we need to be using the word mental health in this discussion as well and be recognizing that mental health is as important as physical health. And mm -hmm. it is a health issue as well as uh, issues um, surrounding uh, you know, resilience, character building. These are all linked, but you know, this is a chance for us to fight the stigma surrounding mental health, use the attention that everyone is putting on mental health to, to say once, uh, once and for all, that mental health should not be so low down in the uh, order of uh, policy priorities. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Junta. That's absolutely, I mean, it's just um, really, really interesting, your points and your, your statistics. And I think what's really important, what springs to mind when you talk about this is that um, across the globe, people, there are, of course, disparities, you know, and, and, the, and it just seems the wealthier you are, the, the, the better your mental health is, as we spoke a little, a little earlier. But I think it's got a lot to do with culture, the type of culture that we create. And in the mo most recent sort of, um, I would say, 
for perhaps five years, we've been talking more and more about mental health. It, it seems it seems okay to talk about mental health and well-being, but I totally agree with you. There are parts of, of the world that it is totally still not okay to talk about mental health. And when you talk about mental health, people think you're mad. Um, and I know I know of those cultures that do a lot of work in some slum areas um, in, in the world. And, you know, you cannot talk about mental health to people because the minute you do, they think that you're going to be carted off, you're carting them off somewhere because they're mad, which we know that what mental health is about. And what's really interesting is what COVID-19 in an interesting way, I think has enabled us all to do is to be able to speak about our mental health, my own mental health. And I've never suffered, I don't think from mental, but now I'm feeling like being isolated, not being able to see my friends or family. You know, we're, we're able to openly now start, start to have those conversations. But going back to culture, I think culture is important in schools and educational establishments, because if you're able to build a culture where students, teachers, leaders, and all other stakeholder groups accept that mental health and well-being is part of the provision that we offer our children, as well as curriculum and assessment, as well as teaching and learning, as well as all of the sort of corporate services associated with the school, that mental health and well-being is one of those areas which is separate from behavior and management because we see the two sort of um, coming together, most um, um, governments or uh, policy papers and, and schools. So I think that's really important that the culture of a school or an establishment is incredibly important. And I would say that's not just the leaders of the school that need to sort of create that culture. It's everybody that we're open mm -hmm. and we're happy to talk about mm -hmm. mental health. I know in my school, we are very much um, aware about mental health issues and we talk about it openly and children will come to, uh, will talk to teachers and other, uh, and their peers about mental health, but we're a long way, long way from being perfect. And one of the things that I feel is really important is to have some specialist support for mental health and wellbeing. So again, it's got to be something that's got to be at the heart of an agenda or policy that the government launches perhaps. And I know that, for example, Marjorie, you'll have some views about specialist support or specialist um, intervention for mental health and well-being. So in, in our country, um, the, the independent schools will have school counsellors, um, educational psychologists, but state schools do not have that privilege. And often you will find one educational psychologist within a whole district. Wow. Um, my daughter gets involved in online counseling and she's still studying psychology. And before lockdown was going into schools through an NGO to offer support where children with mental health were often seen as just troublemakers within the classroom. And I think what we, we have to uh, challenge government on this score is to, to prioritize counselors, educational psychologists. We're talking here about the incredible exacerbation of mental health issues because of the social stresses, economic stresses and, and on our children during COVID-19. And I would really um, like to see an increase in the supply of educational psychologists and counselors and not just see this enormous burden and um, become yet another role that the teacher has to play. All teachers play that role anyway. But with mental health issues, there are certain issues that are beyond a lay person's understanding. And yet they are deep and they are profound. And I would like to pay homage to the school counselors in my community that, that, that cope with all of this and, and, and maintain confidentiality and yet try and make teachers sensitive to mental health issues as far as they possibly can be. Absolutely, Marjorie. Thank you so much. I'm aware of time. It's just so interesting, our conversation. But the second part of the, as the, as the second question I wanted to ask, following up from the points that you made, Marjorie, earlier, was you said that you work in a girls' school and in terms of what the sort of uh, ladies in your school um, are sort of feeling and witnessing in terms of everything that's going around in the world today, not just COVID-19, but the issues of schooling and education in, in its own right, because uh, COVID-19 is just exacerbating, as you've said, lots and lots of different issues that we needed to perhaps address pre-COVID-19, but also Black Lives Matter, discrimination, feeling a sense of um, urgency for freedom uh, in all parts of the world. But, but an interesting um, um, piece of evidence that I read the other day was about gender um, inequality and gender difference. And it seems that, um, you know, sometimes girls can deal with things better than boys. Anna, what do you do you think that there is um, uh, there there is a a specific issue with perhaps boys or girls with mental health um, and well-being at this time? Is there a different way that we need to deal with mental health for boys and girls, or do you think no? Actually, uh, it's pretty much the same in terms of your experience around your peers. 
Um, good question. I mean, I think with the difference between girls and boys that I've witnessed is just that generally, I think with girls, we our support system is sometimes just our entire friendship group. So if we do have a problem, it's very easy to go to our friends and like tell them about it um, and kind of get support. Sometimes maybe not the right support. We aren't. We are still like teenagers ourselves, but at least um, some sort of release of mental stress, knowing there's someone who um, who knows um, about your issues and can support you in them. Whereas with boys, especially when they're younger, um, their friendship groups are a lot more based on like. I don't know, friends, but you don't see that like connection where they're talking about each other's problems as much, um, which I think they could be taught that, and I think it would be a lot more beneficial for um, if if that became normal for them as well. Um, also, I think slightly the the differences while growing up when you get into like teenagers is that um, I mean, I guess it's kind of the same very much like appearance-based um, stress when it doesn't come to academics and um, due to relationships in your friendship groups. Um, and yeah, I don't think there's a difference there. I just think that um, there's still quite a split. And even if you don't really, you don't really see when boys and girls support each other, really because girls like to talk about their own problems with girls and boys will talk about their problems with boys but when it includes the other gender that's when problems arise because they don't communicate that well and I think that's kind of a general phenomenon um and if that communication was taught in schools a bit more then I think that would also help. Thank you Anna and I think I mean, that, that's absolutely right in terms of it's those skills that we need to equip our children with. And those skills are not just based on the academic subjects in the curricula. It's the skills of being able to express oneself. It's, it's, it's uh, skills of being able to talk and communicate and be able to um, ha have relationships with um, with each other and with our peers and, and our teachers and, and our parent um, groups, etc. Really, really important. So listen, I just want to sort of wrap up now, if that's OK. I want to thank the panelists. Where has the time gone? What an interesting um, and, and really, really purposeful, really, really important conversation to have and it's really important that we continue talking about mental health and well-being not just at post covid-19 but why it's so important to be able to absolutely engage with this conversation not just at government and policy level but at a level on which we can actually relate with our children and our parents and the communities around us because too often we hear parents say Yes, that's all very well, but I want good, good grades in science and I want good grades in math and I want good grades in, you know, and so on. But what we need to do is we need to, as a group, as, as, as a group of stakeholders that have the best interests of our children at heart, we need to make sure that we have everything that we can afford these children to have a great experience in education. And as Andrea said earlier, it's about choice, isn't it? It's about that these children leave our education establishments knowing that they can do anything they want to, whether it's going to um, travel the world, whether it's to university, whether it's in, into an apprenticeship or an internship, or whether it's doing some voluntary work, whatever it is, as long as the children have choice. And choice matters, and it comes from character as well as academic subjects. It comes from a mental health which is really, really good, or as good as it can be, because everybody's wrapped their arms around the child and said it's okay to feel anxious, and it's okay to not like the way that you look, but this is how we can make things better. You know, all of those things are important, and there is a role, a big role for teachers, but we do need to have training for teachers to be able to do this properly, because it's something that we need confidence in. So what I would like to do is I'd just like to go around the panel and just your final words on this matter, please. So Andrea, if I can start with you. I just think that um, we're, we're, we're privileged now to be, and I'm very privileged, privileged to be in a society where uh, mental health is spoken about. But what I have learned from this particular conference, and which now really resonates with me, is that it's not just about the character building. We need to put mental health and at the forefront of everything we do. I think if our young people, if our teachers, if the world is not in a good place, if they can't recognise the trigger points, um, then there's no going forward and we can't we can't thrive. So for me, that's the seed that has now been planted in my in my mind. And then what I will I will uh, learn and hopefully gain from this experience. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you for joining us today. Marjorie. I I just think that the pandemic has reminded us that as much as we can carry on teaching in isolation, that we need each other. 
that there is a need for creativity in education, for compassion and understanding of social issues and social justice, as well as critical thinking around the curriculum. And that I think we need to be gentle with each other, that schools need to support teachers who need to support students. And we need to also recognize that this pandemic has shown the, the need for all the different subjects within our school to be weighted equally and not just to think of careers, but to think of ourselves as holistic human beings. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you very much for joining us today, Marjorie. Really, really appreciate your time. Shunta, any last comments from you? Yeah, so I, I think having heard everyone's opinion, uh, you know, it's, it's come, it, I've, I'm now even more strongly believe in the importance of uh, addressing inequalities and how that can drive uh, inequalities also in, in mental, mental health. Um, and it was also really great to hear the perspectives of both teachers and students in this discussion. And I hope that you know, policymakers can continue to, to really do this um, because it's really important that the policies we make, the policies we promote to governments or support governments in putting in place, take into account the perspectives uh, of teachers and students. And then just as a final point, I think, you know, the, the one perhaps silver lining of all this is that people are talking more about mental health probably than ever, ever before. Um, and so, you know, what's really important is that going forward, uh, not just uh, during the COVID crisis, not just within the, over the next year, but over the next years, decades to come, that we really continue to talk about mental health and put it higher and higher up in our policy agenda. Thank you, Shinta. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your time today and joining us. Anna, any last words from you? Um, yeah, I think just the whole thing that we've recognized that mental health and definitely academic achievement goes hand in hand a lot of the time and that's why you need these provisions also i just want i'm and the whole thing that mental health isn't something that um just the issues didn't just arise out of covid19 and they happened beforehand as well but i do think that it is so important to deal with in schools because hopefully teachers have the opportunity to deal with the first maybe significant mental health challenges that a person has in their life. And if they have, if they get the right support, if they have a positive experience, that just makes them so much more resilient for the rest of their life because they've, they have the faith that they can get through mental health challenges. And that is just one area which teachers have a really big responsibility and just the chance to make such a big difference. And yeah, it's just so important that it's talked about and considered. Thank you so much, Anna. What a great place to end in terms of making sure teachers have training, teachers are aware of um, their responsibilities, but other people in and around education are also aware of their responsibilities of mental health. I want to just finish by um, uh, really giving a message from the Varki Foundation to all the teachers that are watching, as well as all the um, uh, panelists um, here today. I just want to say 10 points for you. You are so valuable. All you teachers across the globe who have made sure that the children continue to teach or are continue to being fed. You are enough. You have a voice. You are seen. You are capable. You are going to be absolutely fine as teachers when we return to school because we will make sure you are as leaders, as school leaders. You are brilliant. You have saved lives. Never has it been truer. You have saved lives. I mean, you know, it's not just about offering the routine and the, and, and the sort of policies and, and the um, education online or offline, wherever you are in the country uh, world. It's really about making sure that the mental health and well-being of children is, uh, is a priority. And today, teachers are saving lives. You have supported not just your school communities, but the local and the national communities to which you belong. And you are all, you are all very much superheroes. And we thank you at the Varki Foundation for all the great work you do. This has been Talking Education. Your voice matters. You have a place um, in society to make a difference. Thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thank you. Thank you.